It's this nice, with our Monster Hunter world and newfangled mantles and slinger contraptions. Back in my day, we used to do things old school and work hard for our hunts and rewards without any of these shortcuts. Scout flies, more like crutch flies. Bah, humbug. So you caught the monster hunting bug from Monster Hunter World and are eager to try the different pastures of Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate. If World was your first Monster Hunter game, there are some key differences you'll need to be aware of when you switch, puns are totally intended, <laughs> to the older Generations Ultimate. See, World introduced so many quality of life changes through the Monster Hunter formula that some of the features and mechanics from the older series might seem cumbersome and downright archaic. If you're prepared, however, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to rock the franchise's old school mechanics and have fun with them like millions of other hunters before you. That's right, millions. Millions, I say. Plus, the Generation series is the only entry in the franchise that lets you use hunting styles, which makes it unique even among old school Monster Hunter games. And while the mechanics might seem clunkier, at least it's not first generation Monster Hunter mechanics. Now that is some hardcore masochism right there. On that note, Here's what's different when moving from World 2 Generations Ultimate. Are you impressed by those speedruns in World and their blazing fast times? While they certainly tip off my hat to Monster Hunter World's speedy conquests, they still don't hold a candle to the solo online speedruns from past games in terms of degree of difficulty. And I'm not just saying that as an old school player. That's because online missions for past Monster Hunter games are always scaled for multiplayer even if you decide to run them solo. Basically in past games, missions used to be divided between offline village quests and online guild quests. Village quests are like solo quests in world where monsters have scaled down HP and stagger values to make them more manageable for one player. Guild quests are like multiplayer hunts in world where the monster gets more health and requires you to inflict more damage in order to stagger them. For its part, World removed the distinction by combining all quests into one system and scaling down monster HP and stagger values when a person decides to play a mission solo. That is with the exception of special missions like Cove Teroth and Behemoth. In contrast, older games essentially use the village quest portion for the campaign like a story mode that introduces you to the game while pretty much gating the primary content, including the best gear and toughest monsters, behind the online quests. This means that in order to truly enjoy what Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate has to offer, you'll either need to be an exceptional solo player or go online and play with people. Personally, I've played the bulk of the franchise by two manning most missions with a cousin of mine. Even past games tend to be too easy with four players, but the challenge is just right with two people. Monster Hunter World introduced tents that allow you to restock on items and change gear while mid mission. That is not the case with previous games like Generations Ultimate. Out of Mega Potions or Pierce 3 ammo, you'll have to craft them on the field, buddy. Regret bringing that insect glaive instead of a heavy bow again. You'll either need to suck it up and finish the mission with the glaive or quit it if you want to use a different weapon. Whatever gear or items you bring with you, that's pretty much it outside the stuff you can gather on the field. This makes preparation even more important. The Hunter Flex is one of the most iconic actions in the Monster Hunter series. It's also a move that has engendered a love-hate relationship among players of the franchise. See, one of the quality of life improvements made in the world is the ability to heal while moving. Although you can't move as fast, it still gave you some mobility when healing in a pinch. This means you need to make sure you've got a good opening when healing yourself in battle against a monster, perhaps even move to a different zone in the map. Otherwise you risk getting clocked by that monster again perhaps even carding if you do so while in low health. Honestly, it's not really meant to annoy you, even though it tends to do that for a lot of people. It's just another mechanic that prevents heal spamming and helps keep the game's challenge in balance. Speaking of moving to a different zone, maps in older Monster Hunter games have hard boundaries between areas. Unlike World's maps, which act like one big seamless area, the different zones in Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate need to be loaded every time you switch places. Admittedly, it can get annoying to have to deal with loading screens every time you change zones. On the plus side, it also serves as a great mechanic for escaping a monster when you're in trouble and only got a sliver of red health left. In fact, I purposefully fight tough bosses near zone exits for that same reason, especially when doing online hunts solo. Looking at you, Rajang. <laughs> Not sure why, but that guy always gives me a tough time.
You gotta admire the Huntsman for his doggone dedication to keep things old school. That includes opting not to use the Slinger, which has since become a vital tool for hunters in the world. The absence of the Slinger in Generations Ultimate means no latching on wedge beetles for faster climbing or shooting crystal bursts to stagger monsters. You can still use Dung, Sonic, and Flash Bombs, but your hunter has to literally throw them at the enemy, with Flash Bombs especially requiring good aim and placement in order to work. Do you enjoy opening up your map during a hunt, picking a campsite, and latching on to your trusty wing drake to quickly travel to that location? Well, get ready to start walking. <laughs> or running. <laughs> That's because past Monster Hunter games do not have fast travel outside of using, say, a farcaster to teleport back to camp. It's kind of like those stories about your grandpa where he says he used to walk a mile to get to school through rough terrain. You actually have to do that <laughs> in older Monster Hunter games. World scout flies have been a boon for hunters who either have trouble remembering maps or want to be able to quickly find gathering spots for certain items. It's kind of like using a souped up glowing version of Google Maps for directions. In contrast, Generations Ultimate is like going back to the 1990s, when today's iteration of the super fast, super modern internet that we all know and love was just a series of tubes in someone's mind and folks had to buy maps at like Walmart. It makes exploring akin to an old school road trip without the hand-holding you get from the disembodied voice of your smartphone. If you've gotten used to bringing up that radial menu and quickly picking items, well, that's gone in Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate. And while the 3DS version of the game allowed you to use the second screen as a quick action shortcut menu, the Switch version limits you to one screen, which gives you less flexibility in crafting and picking items right away. The world lets you gather fast, not just by being able to gather multiple items at once sometimes, but also being able to pick up certain items on the field without breaking your stride. That pretty much goes proof in Generations Ultimate, where you have to park your character at a gathering spot and spend extra time collecting stuff, whether it's herb, a god bug, or a macalite ore. You will also need to bring gathering items such as pickaxes and bug nets in order to gather, which take a slot in your item pack. Those things can break by the way at least when you're doing gathering as a hunter. That's why I recommend doing gathering runs as a palico, since they possess unlimited gathering contraptions and those contraptions don't break. That's right, you can play as a palico in the Generation series. Although a lot of the aforementioned differences I've mentioned so far can be seen as downsides from a quality of life perspective, the ability to play as a cat is actually one of the advantages that Generations Ultimate has over the newer Monster Hunter world. Playing as a Palico, affectionately dubbed the 15th weapon by some fans, is one of the things I really 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 miss when playing Monster Hunter World. It's just a fun and goofy addition that's perfect <laughs> for folks who love Monster Hunter's felines. World allows you to have partial skills without fully investing all the necessary points for the full skill. Investing one point in Part Breaker, for example, gives you the level 1 version of the skill for 10% damage towards breaking parts. Two points gives you level 2 for 20%, and three points gives you the full skill for 30% damage. In Generations Ultimate, skill points typically need to be added in sets of 10, and you're required to have the full complement of points invested in order to activate the skill. Otherwise, you don't get the skill at all. You have exceptions such as attack, which has various levels, but those are on top of the original 10 point threshold. So you get attack up medium when investing 15 points, and attack up L when investing 20 points. Armor in Generations Ultimate can also come with negative skill points, which end up as penalties instead of buffs. You get enough negative points in the attack skill, for example, and you'll end up with an attack down debuff that lowers your damage. While adding damage numbers to Monster Hunter World was a controversial decision among series purists, I found it to be a very helpful tool in determining whether I was doing optimal damage. That's not the case in Generations Ultimate, where damage indicators are not an option. It's not a big deal in the grand scheme of things, especially for veterans of the game, but it also means you need to know your weak points and ideal spots for each monster in order to inflict optimal damage. If you're in love with that Temporal Mantle or that Affinity Booster, you're gonna miss them when transitioning to Generations Ultimate. 
That's because special equipment, such as mantles and boosters, don't exist in the game. This will make the game's tougher monster fights especially difficult, but that's honestly par for the course for any old-school Monster Hunter game. Historically, adapting the Monster Hunter isn't necessarily about the game getting easier over time, but the player actually getting better. Basically, you are your own wall. If you're a Blade Master who's been spoiled by World's unlimited stock of whetstones, well, that perk's gone in Generations Ultimate. That means you'll need to bring your own whetstones. Plural. <laughs> as they are one-time use items in the older games. Redstones also take up slot in your item patch, so plan for your inventory accordingly. The behind-the-shoulder orientation from Monster Hunter World has made gunning so much easier, especially as far as aiming is concerned. Generations Ultimate, on the other hand, uses a camera angle that's more oriented toward an action game, which can make aiming more challenging. You have the option to switch to first-person mode for better aim, but that also roots you on the spot, which you don't want to do too long in any Monster Hunter game. Otherwise, there's an option to use a reticle that you can freely move around without zooming in. Pogan users also lose special ammo such as Wyvern Heart, Wyvern Snipe, and Wyvern Blast. On the plus side, you get a nice selection of hunting arts to help you out. Mounting is a lot easier and a lot more streamlined in Generations Ultimate. You don't need to worry about moving from one body part to another. Instead, you just stick to one spot and switch between stabbing the monster in the back and bracing when it tries to throw you off. You do miss the ability to target specific body parts, and you also can't use the cool-looking finishers. On the plus side, toppling a monster also happens much faster. Pro tip, always hold the brace button even when you're stabbing. This makes it easier to transition to bracing when you stop mashing the attack button while mounted. When monsters converge on the same zone in world, it's usually an opportunity for you to sit back, maybe heal or sharpen, and also get free damage as the creatures fight each other. That's not the case in Generations Ultimate. Nope, they're gonna make a straight beeline toward your location and gang up on your sorry carcass. <laughs> they can still damage each other, but not to the extent that they do when fighting each other during turf wars. This makes carrying dung bombs even more important, especially when fighting stronger monsters. You don't want to end up as the curled up human ball in a double monster pinball machine. As someone who likes to try different weapons in theory craft armor sets, the lack of a training area is something I've lamented in older Monster Hunter games. It's just nice having a practice area where I can test damage as well as weapon moves. One alternative in Generations Ultimate is to load up a gathering quest and just practice in camp. It's not the best, but like Mighty Number no. 9, it's better than nothing. <laughs> One of the neat things about Generations Ultimate is the ability to fight stronger versions of monsters known as Deviants. They're like subspecies or arc temper monsters in a sense, but come with their own leveling dynamic that's almost like a subquest of sorts. I especially like the fact that you have Deviant versions of normally weaker monsters such as Lagambi, which makes hunting them fun again. Then you have crazy strong versions of tougher monsters like Diablos. That's on top of the G-rank monsters, which push the number of available monsters much much higher than what you get in World. I, for example, wish we had the option to fight a deviant great Jaggers in the world. This is not a gameplay thing per se, but it's more of a cosmetic thing. While World definitely has much better graphics, the art style in Generations Ultimate is actually a lot flashier. Instead of the more realistic visual approach taken by Monster Hunter World, Generations Ultimate has an almost anime style vibe with its armor and weapons, the designs of which I actually prefer. Rainbow Pigment also looks much nicer to me in Generations Ultimate than it does in World. Rainbow Pigment also looks much nicer to me in Generations Ultimate than it does in World, which looks like you're rotating between puke green and <laughs> tar brown. <laughs> I know I've said this in videos before, but it bears repeating. This right here is one of the biggest differences between World and Generations Ultimate. I also consider it to be the biggest advantage that Generations Ultimate has over World because you end up getting a diverse set of gameplay options that you've never seen in the series. I mean, I don't think I've ever used Guild Style while playing Generations or Generations Ultimate. 
Now, while I definitely love the rock solid basic playstyle of World, there's something to be said about turning any weapon into an airborne menace against monsters with aerial style, or turning into a counter machine with adept style. With six styles multiplied by the number of weapons, Generations Ultimate gives you a wide array of combat options to choose from. Admittedly, it makes the game easier than past Monster Hunter titles, though still not quite as easy as World. It's also one of the reasons that I wish Capcom would continue the older gameplay style of the series, at least on the Switch. Having that in the new style world games is like having the best of both worlds. Anyway, those are the differences that you'll need to keep in mind when switching from Monster Hunter World to Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate. This holds especially true if World was your first ever Monster Hunter game. As always, feel free to leave any thoughts or questions in the comment section. This is Tavi Sumi, and thank you for watching.